Well, good morning. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Here are scriptural call to worship from Psalm 98, starting in verse 4. Let the whole earth shout to the Lord. Be jubilant. Shout for joy and sing. Sing to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and melodious song. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout triumphantly in the presence of the Lord, our King. We're going to stand together. We're going to join in singing, Good Christian Men Rejoice. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give me heed to what we say. Jesus Christ is born today. Let enemies before him bow. And he is in the danger now. Christ is born today. to start our day together of worship and we certainly want to welcome you uh, to this wonderful time, this wonderful day and uh, the theme of our day is focusing on His glorious birth and throughout the month uh, we'll be focusing on the glorious birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I am so glad that you're present today. Uh, we especially want to say welcome uh, to our friends and guests uh, that are gathered with us this morning, we hope and pray that you'll be greatly encouraged uh, concerning your walk with the Lord and your faith in Him, and uh, pray that our church family uh, will be an encouragement to you in that journey with Jesus. So welcome this morning. Welcome church family. Uh, good to see you in the house of the Lord. I know we've got a busy month ahead of us. Uh, let's be sure that we keep Christ uh, as our priority, uh, that He is the one that we celebrate, and that in the midst of all our, our biz, busyness, we not lose sight of, uh, of His preeminence. So God bless you, church family. Uh, you, you just make my heart uh, give thanks to God uh, every time I think upon you. And uh, so God bless you in your faithfulness today. As we pause this morning to have an opportunity to pray together, uh, a few folks that we want to add and remember in our opening prayer this morning. Uh, I want us to be in prayer for Amanda uh, Surmac. This is Modo and Linda's daughter, and she has had uh, some complications in her pregnancy. And pray for her, especially the first part of this week, tomorrow, as they will be uh, doing a procedure there, uh, but especially lift their family up and uh, this matter up uh, to the Lord. We also want to pray for Allison Craig Miles' uh, dad, Brad Hayden, as he is having uh, quite a uh, challenge uh, concerning his battle with cancer. So let's remember him, pray for him in a specific way uh, this week. And then pray for one of our uh, faithful early service uh, attenders, uh, Brother Robert uh, Cummins, who usually sits right back in the back here. I uh, pray for him. He's been down for several weeks now, and let's all remember Robert and, and keep him lifted uh, before the Lord. All right. Well, folks, let's, uh, let's just pause a minute uh, quietly with your heads bowed. Take a moment and just ask the Lord, say, Father, help me to be able to bring my attention upon you right now. Help me to worship.
Heavenly Father, we admit that as, as busy human beings, Lord, we get so distracted, so much going on in our lives. Lord, we, we worry about a lot of stuff. Lord, we, we have plans and dates that we're trying to separate. We have work responsibilities and deadlines that are pressing on us. Then we, we, we want to we wanna honor you by giving you your time on this Lord's Day to worship you. We want to genuinely worship you in spirit and in truth. We want our, we want our focus to be on Christ. We want to give you undivided um, worship. Help us right now, Lord. We come acknowledging that we need you. We need your help just to even have the ears to hear and have the heart that is willing to surrender, the willingness to yield to you, Lord, to let go of our thoughts, our plans, our purposes, and say, not my will, but thy will be done, Lord. Help all of us right now, especially during this, this wonderful month of celebrating the glorious birth of our Savior. I pray we would truly do that right now in this, this time of worship. Minister to your family here today, Lord. Encourage the discouraged. Give grace to everyone as we need it. Help us, Lord, to find ourselves drawn closer to the Son of God with a deeper love for Him and a passion for Him that just redirects, that changes everything about our, our lives. So we ask that the Holy Spirit would have great liberty, Lord, that we'll give Him that liberty today. We come worshiping You, Lord. Father, be with these special needs. We lift up Brad Hayden to You today. Bless him. You know every need. You know the specifics of his needs. We pray, Father, for Amanda as she's having a difficult time and this moment in her life and bless her and bless their family right now. Father, we pray for Robert that you'll bless and heal and give him grace. And Father, the others in our church family that have been on a long struggle, long journey. Think about Brother Bob Osborne, Mark Wright. We bless them today. We ask that you'll give them strength today. And then, Father, others in our church family, encourage them on this Lord today. May they sense your peace and your presence as their family prays for them. Bless now. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand once again and join together in singing hymn 192, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Scripture says, Now, daughter who is under attack, you slash yourself in grief. A siege is set against us. They are striking the judge of Israel on the cheek with the rod. Bethlehem and Bethlehem. You are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from the antiquity, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she, is who, she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of the ruler's brothers will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd them in the strength of the Lord, in the majestic name of the Lord his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will extend to the ends of the earth. May God bless the reading of his word. your Bibles this morning, if you'll turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 2, and we will remain in this section of the Scriptures this week, next week, as we are in the midst of a series entitled, His Glorious Birth. Last Sunday, we saw the, the miracle 
concerning the prophecies of his glorious birth and how that these prophecies concerning his coming, his birth, were fulfilled uh, to the T of what was predicted. This morning we move to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and together we look at the preciousness of his glorious birth. Now as we come to chapter 2, we, we realize that the, the setting, the time, has changed by approximately nine months from where we ventured, where we studied last Sunday. We know by this time that Elizabeth, who miraculously uh, was able to conceive in her old age, she has already given birth to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is six months old by this point. And here we find this remarkable, sovereign work of God going on in history as it relates to this moment. Luke chapter 2 verses 1 through 7 is going to, I hope, encourage you, number one, to know that the God of the universe is guiding all of the events of history. He's in control. And if he can control the events to the exact time of when Jesus, when the Messiah would have to be born, where he would have to be born, then he can certainly handle controlling and guiding the events of your life. You can rest in him. Trust him. <laughs> he is able. He's capable. And just let's learn to live a life of yieldedness to say, Lord, I surrender all. You, you, can, you can sure take care of, of my life and my needs much better than I can. And I hope that this passage will encourage you as you see the, just the miracle of God's sovereignty working and as we examine the beauty and the preciousness of his glorious birth. Beginning in verse 1, the scripture says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. It's tragic to note that there seemed to still be no room for Jesus in our world. There was no room in that world. There's no room today. We just don't have room for Christ anymore. I can understand not having room in society and the culture and the government. But I pray, folks, that he has room in our heart. And I pray he has room in your home. And I sure pray he has, there's room for him in our church uh, to let him be the Lord. And, uh, and, and that we'll recognize that he is worthy of room in our life. When we look at this section of scripture, we realize that the event that happens here recorded in Luke chapter 2 is an event that was so great that it literally revolutionized history. Do you realize that the birth of Christ was such a monumental event in history that all the world had to pause and realize that even the structure of our calendar had to coincide with this event that took place? We talk about the Old Testament and we'll say things like 700 years B.C., <laughs> 1,000 years B.C., 1,400 years before Christ, this happened. This was prophesied. But now we live in what? We live in the time we call A.D. <laughs> B.C. before Christ, A.D. Anno Domini, that means the year of our Lord. This partic particular event has had an impact 
in the world. It has an impact in history. And we recognize that this event was guided and directed by God, but he even used as his vessels pagan leaders that led to this remarkable event happening exactly where the Bible said it would happen at exactly the time that it would happen to the exact person it would happen to. And when we look at this beginning section, this, these first couple of verses, it describes the time. It says, in those days, in those days, in those days would refer to the day in which Christ was born. We know that it was not a, a good day. It was not a good day for the Jews especially. They were under Roman rule. They hated the Romans. They hated Roman taxation. They would not allow their, their sons to serve in the Roman army. Uh, and they had, were granted that uh, wish and desire. But it was also a day when it seems as though God had been silent. I mean, there had been no fresh word from the Lord. Over 400 years had passed since there had been a, a word from God. And some of the things that we have seen and we saw last week, those prophecies that came about the Messiah, they had taken place 700 years before that event, 500 years before the event. And so it was a time that they were under oppression by Roman rule. There was a dearth for a word from God. Uh, there was this, this lingering hunger for a Messiah to come. They were looking for uh, Yeshua to come into the world and deliver them and set up a kingdom in their day and time. Well, Luke, in recording this event, gives us a little glimpse in the time frame of, of this precious birth. It says that it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Now, when we look back at this, we see the setting and we see the background of this time frame. Now, I want to take a moment here and let's just kind of remind and refresh ourselves of exactly what was going on uh, during this period of time. It says that the decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Now, that wasn't this man's real name. His name was not Caesar Augustus. The word Caesar is a title and it literally means emperor. The, the term Augustus could be translated one who is revered, one who is seen as supreme. It came to mean one who was seen as a god. The leader, the emperor of Rome was seen as a god. It's interesting that in their structure, they saw that man in their mind could become a god. Now, what do we believe? We believe that God became a man. But here in their structure, they desired that their leader would be seen as a god. Well, Caesar Augustus was a man who was born in 63 B.C. His name was Gaius Octavius. Now, he's an interesting character. He was the grandnephew of Julius Caesar. Gaius Octavius mother's name was Atia, and his grandmother's name was Julia. Now, the interesting thing about this person is that Julia was the sister of Julius Caesar. Well, when this boy was born, Julius Caesar, who was the emperor, the ruler over Rome, just had a, took, it, took to this boy. And when he turned 20 years of age, Julius Caesar adopted him to be his son because he wanted him to be heir of the throne. He wanted him to reign in his place. And as most of you know history, you know what happened after that. A year later, Julius Caesar was murdered by his friend Brutus. And when he died, Gaius out of respect to Julius Caesar, changed his name to Gaius Julius Caesar. And he became one of the rulers, one of the leaders of the Roman world. Well, there were two others that also rose to the rank of authority and leadership. And one of those men didn't last long. <laughs> he dropped out pretty quickly. 
And that left two now who were over the Roman Empire. Gaius Octavius or Gaius Julius Caesar and another man named Mark Antony. The interesting thing about Mark Antony is that he was married to Gaius' sister. So it was all in the family. This was royal blood. And here they are. They, they've been placed in a position of leadership and authority over uh, this great empire that existed in that particular time. Well, Mark wasn't a very bright man. He was a man that was kind of uh, influenced. Uh, he was infatuated with women. And there was one woman in particular that he became greatly infatuated with, and her name was Cleopatra. Cleopatra, who was queen of Egypt, uh, Mark Antony, just couldn't get her out of his mind. So what did he do? He divorced. He divorced his wife, who was Gaius, Octavius' sister. And that kind of caused tension in the family. Gaius was having problem with Mark already. And after divorcing his sister, becoming infatuated with Cleopatra, he noticed that Mark Antony was more interested in what was happening in Egypt than what was happening in Rome. And over a period of time, this tension built and built and built to the point that Mark Anthony and Gaius Octavius went to war. Well, Mark, being somewhat of a foolish man already, decided he would go to war and that he would seek to defeat the great navy of Rome. And at the Battle of Actium in 31 B.C., Octavius totally wiped out the Egyptian navy and also became the sole ruler of what we would call that known world. About a year later, Mark Antony and Cleopatra, if you've read any history, you know what happened. They ended up committing suicide. They saw the writing on the wall and took their lives. But here's the sovereign hand of God working. As this man began to rise to this place of great authority and out of respect for what he had done for Rome, his title was then changed to Caesar. He was seen as emperor. He ruled and reigned for approximately 47 years. He was given the title Augustus, the revered one, the supreme one. In one of the Mediterranean towns, they found a, 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 a little placard uh, engraved in stone that basically uh, said that, uh, that, that Octavius, uh, Gaius Octavius, now known as Caesar Augustus, was given the title Savior of the World. Savior of the world. <laughs> that was the call of the day. There was a cry out. We need a Savior. We need someone to save us from ourselves. And here was this great, great leader who ended up guiding in what was called the Pax Romana. Uh, and, and that was literally the Roman peace of that time. It, it allowed peace in the known world. Uh, they began to focus on one language, which became the Greek language. There was, uh, the borders began to be softened where travel was, was uh, easy to do. And as you know the rest of the story, that part of the reason the church flourished in the, uh, in the early church is because of this very Roman peace. There was a common language. There was travel. It made travel easier. Uh, there was the ability to travel from, from border to border without much difficulty. And so even in that, God was orchestrating. His sovereign plan was being fulfilled uh, during that time. Well, after he became the ruler of all the world, which included now Egypt, he decided to adopt a particular thing that Egypt would do every 14 years. And it was called a census. Every 14 years, Egypt would take a census of all of their people, and it was for two purposes. Number one, to make sure their military was strong. Number two, to make sure they were getting all the taxes they could possibly get. And so August, Caesar Augustus determined we're going to have a census in all the world, not just in Egypt, but all the world. Every 14 years, this census would be taken. Well, that's what we have happening here in verse 1. The decree went out. 
He sent out a decree in all the world. He said, we're going to have a registration or a census that would be done. Well, verse 2 gives us a little more clear uh, idea of the time. It says, this census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Now, here's another individual. And it's an individual that some interpreters have questioned the reliability of the Bible. They said, well, there you go. That's an, there's an error there. There's no way that can be true. Because there is evidence that a census was done uh, around A.D. 6 that is recorded. And Quirinius was the governor of Syria at the time in A.D. 6. Well, we know that doesn't fit the history line. So we're thinking, is the Bible wrong? Is there an issue? Well, in 1764, while they were doing uh, some work, uh, a stone was found that detailed that Quirinius was not only a governor between 86 to 9, but he was also governor uh, around 8 BC to about uh, 4 or 2 BC. So he reigned twice. He must have reigned, lost his reign, then he reigned again. And so here we find that the scripture is true. And over time, uh, archaeology comes along and somebody digs up something and it's just like God says to the world, see, <laughs> my word is reliable. So here we have this wonderful uh, example of the sovereign hand of God working through even pagan leaders and emperors during that time. You say, what's significant about this? Well, if the census was taken every 14 years, then that means the one census that it was discovered that Quirinius did was in AD 6. You back it up 14 years, you have 8 BC. The first census that was taken by Caesar Augustus was around 8 BC. Now here's something even more interesting. Caesar Augustus wanted to take this census 27 years before that. But there was, a, there was an issue in the empire. They got sidetracked. It got put on the back burner. And if they would have followed through with it then, it would have messed up everything that we have recorded here. It's as though God said, nope, the timing is not right. The book of Galatians says that in the fullness of time, God sent his son. And here we see that in the fullness of time, God was working it out even through these, these emperors and leaders of that known world, his perfect, perfect plan and his prophecy that would be fulfilled. So what happened? The, the decree went out in 8 BC. Well, the Jews, as you know, as we go from the world setting to their national setting, they hated Rome. They hated Rome. They hated taxes. They certainly hated Jews who would be willing to, uh, to be the ones who would receive the taxes, like we know Matthew or Levi uh, was a tax collector. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. The Jews despised them. And, and in Israel at the time, a man by the name of Herod was the ruler. He was an Edomite. The Edomites had been cursed by God, and the Jews hated the Edomites. So they weren't going to do anything that Rome told them to do. They weren't going to do anything that Herod told them to do. And no doubt and undoubtedly, they put off agreeing to this census. They said, no, we're not doing it. Well, that was given in 8 BC. They had put it off, put it off, put it off, until finally Augustus Caesar said, April 15th is about to roll around. <laughs> you are going to fulfill and you're going to abide by the decree that I've given. And so that gives us a reason of why the census was taken at the time. Why in the world would they plan to do the census at a time of the year where it would be cooler and colder? At this time of the year in Israel, there's the lows in the 40s and even lower than that. Why did they wait till now at this time of the year? Well, April 15th was, was dawning and they had to fulfill the census. Another interesting thing about it is that it says that they had to go up to their own city in verse 3. Well, Rome did not require that. The Romans said, you can register whatever city you live in. You don't have to go to your hometown. But guess what? The Jews said no. Being as meticulous as they were about genealogies and about keeping records, they required that if they're going to be if they're going to have to fulfill the role of the census, then they were going to do it the right way. And they made everyone go to their hometown because at that time, the tribes were 
were basically delegated to certain areas of the land. And they knew, according to the Old Testament, after seven years, land would revert back to the previous owners. And they were very careful uh, to keep those censuses and keep those records clear. In AD 70, when, Jew, when Rome destroyed the temple, they also destroyed all of those records. They were all destroyed. This meant Joseph had to go to Nazareth. That was his birthplace. And here the hand of God is moving over time. He moved through a man named Julius Caesar in world history. He moved through a man named Caesar Augustus. He moved through a man named Quirinius. He moved through a man named Herod. And his divine time on the world setting was being moved to the exact place, the exact time that this had to be fulfilled. If it would have been three months early, it wouldn't have been right. <laughs> It wouldn't have fulfilled the scripture that Chuck read earlier that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Mary wouldn't have traveled to Bethlehem if it had been three months earlier. There would have been no need to travel if it had been three months later. But it was right on time. It was in the fullness of time. And here we see that in the setting of his birth, we see God's sovereign hand working on the world scene, working throughout uh, their, their national scene as far as the people of God, the Jewish people, and the fulfilling of the promise in Micah 5, 2 that was given 700 years before the event happened, and it happened exactly as prophesied. Then that brings us to the setting personally between Joseph and Mary. Verse 4, the Bible says, Joseph went up from Galilee, and when you travel from Nazareth, you don't go down to Jerusalem, you go up. They had a difficult 85 to 90 mile trip ahead of them. Ladies, can you imagine your husband coming to you? You're nine months pregnant. You've got a difficult travel ahead of you. You're going to either be walking or you're going to be riding on the back of a donkey. And he says, we've got to go uh, down to Bethlehem, 85 mile trek in the condition you're in. Now, why did they do that? Mary wasn't required to do it. Joseph could have gone as the head of his household and taken care of the legal issue. I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, I can only imagine what Mary has already gone through in her hometown. When Mary became pregnant, there was certainly probably talk within the village among her kinfolks, as we learned last week. A town of about 150 people. Everybody's kin to everybody. Mary's claiming that she got pregnant because... Holy angel, the Holy Spirit came upon her and everybody's thinking she's lost her brains and mine. And, and then she's had to convince Joseph because in the beginning Joseph couldn't grasp it. He couldn't figure out. He, couldn't, he didn't know what to do. He's, he's engaged to this girl. You've got to remember engagement in that time, the only way you broke an engagement was through a writing of divorcement. It was as binding as marriage. So he's engaged to her and he's questioning how she could claim this. He's trying to decide, do I divorce her, do I put her away privately, or do I follow the Old Testament law that says that when one was found pregnant out of wedlock, she's to be stoned to death. And here's this honorable young man, and let me remind you, they were young. Joseph probably was around 15 or 16 years old. Mary could have been as young as 14 and 15 years old. These are young, young people dealing with major, major matters. And Mary has, has come to terms and peace with what has happened. And then finally an angel spoke to Joseph and said, Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. That which is conceived in her is the holy child. And I believe at that point Joseph did the honorable thing. He went from being engaged to Mary. They had a wedding. They were married. That's why the Bible says in verse 5, he went to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife. You say that doesn't make sense. That's like saying his engaged wife. What that means was that in the legal sense, he was married, but in the fact that the consummation of the marriage, he was still engaged. They didn't consummate the marriage until after Christ was born. This idea that Mary didn't have other children, as Roman Catholicism teaches, is, is false. The gospel tells us that she had many children. She wasn't a perpetual virgin the rest of her life. She didn't have other children in miraculous ways. They were a normal family. They had a normal marriage after Christ was born. But here are these young people, and Joseph recognized that, that Mary 
now when she was six months old, went to live with Elizabeth, who could understand what she was dealing with. He was not going to send her back to Nazareth as he took care of business in Bethlehem. And can you imagine, he was, he was himself overwhelmed with the miracle of God in the birth of the Son of God. He's like any good dad. He wants to be there when that baby's born. He said, Mary, this is going to be tough, but you're going with me. He was going to watch over her. He didn't want her to be under the, the talk of the town. And they made this long trip to Bethlehem. Just think about the places as they were making their way up to Jerusalem into Bethlehem. They had to pass Shiloh. Shiloh, the very place where Hannah, Hannah prayed to God, God, give me a son. She prayed for a child. She, she was misunderstood by the, by the high priest. He thought she was drunk and she was pleading with God for a child. And God gave her a child there in Shiloh. They passed through Gilgal where that same son, the son of Hannah, ended up becoming a judge over Israel, Samuel. They then passed their way through Bethel, the house of God, where many of the patriarchs had unbelievable encounters with God. They passed through that place. They went through Ramah, where the Bible says that Rachel was heard weeping for her children. And we know that at the birth of Christ, after he was born, there was weeping in that area of Jerusalem as Herod went out and killed all the boy babies two years of age and younger before he himself died. Then they made their way through Jerusalem. They made their way through Jerusalem there in Jerusalem where Mount Moriah would be found. Where the Dome of the Rock sits right now, that's Mount Moriah. That's the very place where Abraham would be willing to offer up his son on the altar until God said, no, Abraham, I know now I have your heart. No, don't harm the child. And then they made their way six miles further from Jerusalem into that little town called Bethlehem. This was the town of Ruth and Boaz, where we learned the story of the kinsman redeemer who would come. We learned that this is the place where David, King David, was born. And when you go to Jerusalem today, they'll take you on a tour and you'll go to a place, they call it the City of David. It's just a little bit further down from where the Dome of the Rock is. It's a little further down, and, and, and that's called the City of David. But in that time, in, in the time of Luke, that whole region, that whole area uh, there around Mount Moriah is called the City of David. But let me tell you, the, the, the City of David that they call today may be the place where he reigned, but Bethlehem was also the City of David because that's where he was born. And they made their way to Bethlehem late fall, late winter, and the scripture says that as they made their way there to Bethlehem to be registered with his betrothed wife who was with child. In verse 6. And so it was. While they were there, the days were complete. You would think there would be more fanfare about the birth of Jesus. But it's that simple. We not only see the settings of the sovereign hand of God working concerning the birth of Christ, but we also see the simplicity of the birth of Christ. It was just, it was like any birth. The baby was born. He didn't come out doing miracles. He didn't come out and never cried. He didn't come out and not have to be fed and his diaper changed. He came out crying. It was a cry of life. And just imagine in that moment when he was born, God was clothed in humanity's flesh. The dangers of that, a baby, not a man, a baby. God wrapped in human flesh. All oh, the simplicity of it, the beauty of it, the preciousness of it, of the child born at the right time, in the right place, the fullness of time. And it was that while they were there, the days were complete for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son. That means her firstborn. It means her first. <laughs> she had other sons. She had other daughters. He wasn't the only. <laughs> she brought forth her firstborn son. Folks, I want you to think about things surrounding the simplicity of that birth. Think about the family. Think about Joseph and Mary. They had been ostracized from their community. 
They had been the butt of jokes. They had been uh, the brunt of rumors. They had th things said about them behind their back. This young couple, 15, 14, 16 years old, carrying the fact that they are going to be used of God to bring into the world the Messiah. I can only imagine Joseph in that moment, though they had felt the sting of rumors and being ostracized in that moment as he is there by the side of his wife. There's no family with him. There's no grandparents who in and on over the birth of a child. There's no friends there to lend moral support. It's just them all alone with the animals in that little place. But oh, imagine when that baby's born and Joseph takes that boy in his hands and he knows this is the Son of God. And as Mary takes that precious baby in her hands and brings him up to herself so that he could feed, she could plant a kiss on the cheek of the very Son of God in that moment. The simplicity of it, the beauty of it, the preciousness of it. All the cost that they had gone through, the ridicule and the rumors just kind of dissipated in that moment when he was born. Oh, when you've been there, mom, dad, grandparents. Oh, yeah, the agony, the pain of nine months carrying a child. Sometimes the, the, the difficulty of birth. But oh, oh, when the baby's born, there's the sense of awe, the sense of wonder, the sense of unexplainable, of the preciousness of what has happened there. That's what they felt. But I also see in that very place the humility Simplicity in nature, but the humility of that place. You know, it was a time where the census is being taken. People are traveling from all over the place. There are government officials there from Rome that are overseeing the census. Uh, there are Jews that are making sure that the, uh, the census is done right and that the names are verified and they're keeping accurate records. You have people traveling in, and as they get there, there's no room. <laughs> they didn't have... You know, hotels on every corner. There were no inns to, uh, to go and stay at. It was basically just a, it's kind of like a campground situation. Maybe a, maybe a building that had four walls, maybe two stories at the top would be little dwelling spots. We're not talking about room with bed and, and, and facilities. Just a place where you would bring your own pillows and your, your own uh, cover and you would just find a place there to rest at night. Below that would be where the animals were parked. <laughs> kind of like pulling into a hotel today and you got the parking lot with all the cars. Well, all their cars were parked in the first floor. Their donkeys, their animals, their belongings are kept there. There was no dwelling place, but there was a spot they had to take there amongst the animals. If you want to call it a manger, some have tried to say it might have been a cave. We don't know. We just know that somewhere around 6 to 4 B.C., the Son of God was born in a humble place in a city called Bethlehem. The humility of it all. Think about that little place. A place where the stench had to be unbearable. They're living among animals. The stench of the possessions of the people who have traveled the smell of humanity, the smell of nature, the smell of the creatures that had probably infiltrated into their own clothing, the stench of that that they had to bear in that place. But I want to tell you, it's nothing to compare to the stench of sin that God the Father has had to bear as He smells. And there's the baby. It says she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloth laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And that day and time when a baby was born, they just recognized, you know, that little baby's been in a nice little womb, sealed, closed, tight. Now the baby's born. They didn't want it flailing around. They wanted it to feel safe. And what they had to do, they'd take long, long little strips of cloth and they would wrap their arm to keep them straight. They would wrap their legs to keep the legs straight. They thought that would help the bones to develop better. Uh, and they would do that first to the legs and arms. And then after that, they would wrap their little body, <laughs> kind of like a little womb, and, and would put the cloth around it. And the baby would feel stiff, but also comfortable and, and safe in the arms of, of its parents. And here Jesus is 
dealt with as any little child would be. And there they laid him in a manger. The manger here was literally a feed trough. They put him in a feed trough. It feed, a food trough at that place would probably have been a stone that had been hewn out where they would drop the feed for the animals to eat from. But now it became his bedding. It became his place of rest. And they laid him, the Son of God, in this food trough because there was no room for them in the dwelling places, in the inn, in the place where most would have been resting. And here he is. What I see in this, folks, and the precious of His glorious birth is the miracle of God's control over history. He was moving. He was working. It matters not who the rulers of the world are. God is able to even take the most pagan of rulers and, and fulfill His will. Let us never forget that, folks. Let us never fear who reigns in Washington who reigns on the world empires in China and Russia and Japan, our God is still sovereign. He is still the Almighty. He is still the one that can enact and make His will uh, and have it accomplished in spite of that, in spite of how pagan the rulers are. Trust Him with your life. Trust Him with the plan that He has for you. Rest in that. Quit worrying about little things that, that matter not, that you can't control anyway. Just yield to Him and say, God, I yield myself. I yield my marriage. I yield my children. I place them in Your hand. You know what is best. God, direct and lead them. We also recognize and reminded that this precious one born in that place was God who became a man. He was God. Caesar, the man who was called a God. Jesus was God who became a man and was able to dwell among us and was able to become the mediator between God and men, made it possible for our salvation. But then last of all, the beauty of this and preciousness of it. He was born in Bethlehem. You know what Bethlehem means? House of bread. He was born in the house of bread. Who was Jesus? He is the bread of life. And guess where he was placed when he was born? In a feed trough. <laughs> a food trough. The bread of heaven was born in the city of bread so that he might, he might fill the deep hunger of every soul. This morning, if you're here and you say, man, I feel like something's missing. I'm trying to fill my life with these things. I consume, I consume, and I consume, and I'm still empty. I'm, there's, there's a hunger. It's not a physical hunger. It's a spiritual hunger. I'm hungry. I am hungering for something. There's something missing in my life. You need to see that this precious one born that we celebrate, he's the bread of life. He is the only one that can, can, can fill the emptiness of your life. Born in the city of bread, placed there before, uh, for, before humanity in a trough where we can come, just like an animal coming to the feed trough, just to consume. It's there. It's been placed there. What do they do? What does the animal have to do? They don't have to earn it. They don't have to plead for it. They just have to go and receive it. And God has placed the bread of life right here for you where you can reach Him. He came down so we could see Him and could understand Him. And He is just laying out before us and placing before us this wonderful gift, this bread of life that will fill you, will change you, will transform your life. But the question is, will you come? Will you come to the place where you can find bread? Come and receive the bread of life. I love what Adrian Rogers always used to say about sharing Jesus. He said, folks, witnessing is so simple. It's so simple. It's just one beggar telling another beggar where he can find bread. Folks, I'm a beggar, but I found bread. This morning, I want to invite you to come and receive the bread. Jesus, if you've never been saved, you've never yielded your life to Christ, come right now and receive Jesus.
If you're here and you're a child of God, you haven't been walking obediently to the Lord. Remember Mary. Remember Joseph. In spite of the ostracism, in spite of the rumors, in spite of the ridicule, in spite of their age. Think about it, young people. Would you have done that? 13, 14, 15 years old, they're walking in that type of of steadfastness and obedience? Are you willing to come today and say, take my life, Lord, and use it however you please? I'm yours. Are you willing to surrender, young person? Are you willing to surrender, uh, elderly uh, friend? Are you willing to come and say, not my life, but Lord, it's yours? Are you willing, no matter the cost, to say, I'm going to follow Jesus? No matter the cost. That's what they did. Let them be your example today. This time before us right now is our invitation. You come. We invite you to come today to yield your life to Jesus. We invite you to come to yield yourself to Jesus. We invite you to come to say, today I'm going to be obedient to Jesus. Whatever you need to do, as we glory in His birth, the beauty and preciousness of His birth, honor Him right now. We're going to stand and sing. But for you, if you need to come, make your way out of where you're standing and come and say, I'm going to yield totally to the Lord Jesus Christ.